Hi, good morning. You're listening to I Antique with Bruce, and I'm Bruce. Last week we were talking about multicultural figurals and their allure. Today we will be talking about Pocket Watches, the timeless collectible. We're coming to you every Saturday from 6 to 7 a.m. on KCMO, Talk Radio 710, and now on FM 103.7. We're brought to you by the Brass Armadillo and our sister networking site of iAntique.com, your home for antique and collectible social networking. If you have any questions or comments before, during, or after the show, please feel free to go to iAntique.com and click on the Ask Bruce button located at the top. There you'll be able to send us your thoughts, questions, and any photos that you would like to share. Today we'll be talking about pocket watches, the timeless collectible, My guest today is Vern Platon, and his lovely wife, Gloria, is here with us also. They're dealers in my mall, and they have traveled all the way from Denver to set up a case of unique and awesome pocket watches right here in Kansas City. Vern, thanks for being with me today. Happy to be here, Bruce. Well, I guess let's kind of get started here a little bit. I guess you've been collecting for a long time, Vern. Just how long has it been? Well, it's been probably 65 years. I started when I was a boy with watches that my granddad would give me that were too old for him, and then one keepsake watch of his that his mother had given him and saved for three years in order to buy it. So, Oh, my goodness. That got me started. So what about pocket watches do you find interesting, Vern? I find lots fascinating about them. There's so many different types. They're historical they uh, cover great time periods, the railroad age, the industrial revolution, uh, the revolutionary war, the civil war. Uh, they were the muscle car of their day. They were a prestige symbol in the old days. Uh, they come in many sh- shapes, sizes, and were used for many specific reasons. And there's just all kinds of things to learn about them and from them. Awesome, Vern. Well, if a person, dealer or customer, wants to buy a pocket watch, just what should they look for? Well, the the main components are, of course, the dial, the case, and the movement. And in the old days, you didn't buy a complete watch. You would buy uh, three components. You'd go into a jeweler's store and pick out a movement. He would then show you a number of dials that would work on that watch. You would select a dial. Then he would show cases that would fit the watch, and you would then select a case. So you would have a uh, a component type of uh, a composite for a watch. And so first, if you're going to look at a dial, and you're a, an ordinary dealer that doesn't specialize in watches, you want to stay away from things that aren't in good shape and aren't running. So look first at the dial. Is it crazed? By that I mean a lot of little checkerboard marks. Or is it chipped, like with a wedge out at the 11 o'clock? Or does it have hairlines, which might be a straight line going from the uh, center pivot where the hands are located down to the outer edge, or maybe one clear across? If you have much of that, you probably want to pass the watch. Next thing is more aesthetics. Uh, Look at the dial. Is it got... uh, an Arabic time numbers or Roman numerals? Is it a fancy dial? Like you and I have looked at watches with the fancy dials and as opposed to the many different types of plain dials. There's, of course, the flat dial, then there's the, sink, the single sunk dial that has only a, a indented ring for the second hand, and then there's the double sunk dial like you see on railroad watches. And those, of course, are more of the higher-end watches. Then there's advertising dials. There might be anything from something like Harley-Davidson in the old days. They used to put out watches. Packard Automobile, Cadillac, a lot of places did that. There's specialty dials to look for. Again, you and I have uh, uh, viewed many of those on railroad watches with either the plain bold uh, Arabic numbers or the the fancy uh, Montgomery dials with the 60-second register actually numbered 60 seconds around the outer uh, ring of the dial, or a Ferguson dial that was, again, uh, a railroad dial that had a 24-hour chapter also. Next, you can look at the hands, and you want to 
one, are they there? Two, are they in place? Uh, are they straight? Uh, are they bent? Are they rusty? Uh, can you set the watch? And here again, then you get into, is it a, to set it, is it a key wind watch, a pendant set watch, which means you pull out the crown? Is it a lever set watch? Or, or is it a, uh, or is it a pin set watch? And then you would look at, uh, whether they're original hands, common or fancy. That's really interesting. Well, if you're just now joining us, we're talking about pocket watches, the timeless collectible. You're listening to I Antique with Bruce, and we're brought to you by the Brass Armadillo and iAntique.com. My guest is Vern Platon. Vern, let's get back into it a little bit. Um, I know that there are all types of watches, and they all have movements. Can you tell us a little bit more about watch movements? Yes, uh, and that's one of the three items that you need to watch for. Uh, we've talked about hands and the dial. Uh, we haven't covered the case yet, but the movement you want to look at, if you're thinking about buying a watch, open up the back of the watch, look at the movement, see if all the visible screws uh, seem to be in place, if uh, uh, if there's any empty holes anywhere to where you know something is missing. Is the movement clean? Does it have patina? By that I mean some light discoloration or graying of the metal. That's not so bad. If you see rust, put the watch down and walk away, even if it can be cleaned. If a watch has gotten rusty, you're probably going to lose the tensile or resilience of a mainspring or a hairspring or other parts that won't last. You'll never have a watch that will keep time, even if you do get it repaired. Uh, again, with the movement, if you're examining a watch, does the balance wheel move freely if you shake it? or if you wind it a little bit and it runs. If it just lays there and you can't move it even by hand, you probably have a broken balance staff. Walk away. Uh, if, you're, if you're not in business to fix watches yourself, then you don't need to pick up someone else's broken watch. The other thing to look at is uh, the mainspring. You can't tell if a mainspring's intact by just looking at the watch, but if it's a watch that you wind, and keeps winding and winding and winding, but doesn't run or doesn't keep running, then you either have a loose or a broken mainspring. The other thing to look for as a dealer thinking about buying a watch at an estate sale or garage sale is, uh, can you wind it, and can it set, and does it run? If it does, think about buying it. We'll go through more factors to have, to determine whether you want a particular watch, but by and large, if a watch doesn't run, or if it's in bad condition, walk away. The uh, one factor we haven't considered yet is the case. Uh, on a watch case, many of them are hinged. Look closely, see does it open and close properly? Are the hinges loose or are they starting to break? Uh, if it's a, a screw-off case, like as you know, uh, yes, mo sir. most of the railroad watches were, then is it cross-threaded or does it uh, does the back and front of the uh, case come, come off of the frame easily. Look and see for dents. Dents can often be taken out, but wear is something else. If you have a gold fill case and it's worn down to brass, it's not going to have much value. If it's a silver or a gold case and all the graving is uh, worn off, again, you're looking at something that may not be uh, too desirable. Final thing, and maybe most important on a watch case, is what material is it made of. On the older watches, they were almost always gold or they were silver. Nickel and then gold fill came along later. And nickel has uh, many names other than nickel used on watch cases. It can be <laughs> silver road, silver ride, silverine, uh, German silver, any number of names. Those are all nickel. Gold fill is two plates of gold that are laminated under heat and pressure to a centerpiece of metal, usually brass or copper, can be base metal. And those are the factors that you look at for determining whether, whether you're going to even look at a watch initially. That's really interesting, Vern. I've learned a whole lot just in this short time. But you're listening to I Antique with Bruce, and our show today is Pocket Watches, the timeless collectible. We're brought to you by the Brass Armadillo Antique Mall, and the iantique.com. That's I-A-N-T-I-Q-U-E dot com. 
You can also follow us on Facebook at Kansas City Barass Armadillo. Coming up at the store over the July 4th weekend, we'll be having 15% off sale for three days, July 4th, 5th, and 6th. On the 4th, which is Friday, we'll be serving up homemade apple pie starting at 11. Then on the 5th, we'll be having hot dogs and chips for lunch. On Sunday the 6th, we'll be serving up a treat of cookies and punch all day long. Of course, all three days, any and all merchandise that you purchase will be 15% off. Next week's show will be How to Be a Profitable Antique and Collectibles Dealer, and we'll dig into just what you can do to make a profit while selling something that you love, antiques. We'll be right back. When we come back, we'll be talking more about how pocket watches are a timeless collectible. Our guest today is Vern Platon. Thanks, Vern. You're welcome, Bruce. Glad to be here. KCMO, Kansas City's home of Michael Savage. They've confused sexual liberation with uh, far more important liberations, and that's a great, great scam in order to imprison an entire generation, which is to turn them all into sexually promiscuous uh, beings and then tell them to do whatever they want and let them think they're free and then to hobble them with socialism. The Savage Nation, weekdays 2 to 5 on KCMO Talk Radio 710 and 103.7 FM. Talk in Kansas City. KCMO Talk Radio 710, now on FM at 103.7. Attention antique shoppers, if you're looking for the ultimate antique adventure, you will find it at the Brass Armadillo Antique Mall, just off I-70, between exits 21 and 24 in Grain Valley. We are the perfect place to stroll aisle after aisle of fine antiques and collectibles. Whether it's our fine antiques, vintage, or retro items, we have them all. Antiques are what we know at the Brass Armadillo, with hundreds of of antique dealers and millions of items, it is a shopper's paradise. So come on out to the Brass Armadillo Antique Mall, just off I-70 between exits 21 and 24 in Grain Valley. We're open 9 to 9 every day. Come see what everybody's talking about. That's the word. We got everybody talking. Antiques are all we know. We got everybody talking. Everybody's talking about the Brass You deserve a vacation, an all-inclusive vacation. On Saturday, July 12th, Cruise Holidays and Comfort Tours at I-29 and 72nd Street are hosting an all-inclusive vacation extravaganza seminar and sale where you can learn about many of the all-inclusive resorts available to you. Destinations like Puerto Vallarta, Punta Cana, Cancun, and the Riviera Maya. Cruise Holidays and Comfort Tours has also arranged to have Bob Black with Avalon Waterways on hand to talk about river cruising as a new all-inclusive experience. These events are often full of countless excited travelers. So please RSVP right now by calling 816-505-1500. 816-505-1500. Come listen to travel experts share opportunities from Funjet Vacations, Marival Residences, Charisma Resorts, Hard Rock Cafes, all-inclusive collections, and Live Aqua. Again, these events are often full of countless excited travelers, so please RSVP right now by calling 816-505-1500. Guess what Vanguard thinks of financial advisors? Hi, Rick Edelman here. Vanguard, the big mutual fund company, is famous for catering to do-it-yourself investors. And yet Vanguard has just released a study saying financial advisors offer you tremendous value. Advisors like Edelman Financial Services can add 3% a year to our clients' net returns. How do advisors do this? Vanguard says we can help clients avoid emotional decision-making, like selling when the market is down. Your returns can also improve thanks to the asset allocation and rebalancing strategies that advisors like us use. And we can even help you lower your taxes when generating income in retirement. We offer lots of value at Edelman Financial Services, and now even Vanguard recognizes it. See for yourself how we can help. Visit us at rickedelman.com. That's ricestelman.com. Or call us at 888-PLAN-RIC. Advisory services offered through Edelman Financial Services, LLC. Securities offered through Sanders Morris Harris, Inc., an affiliated broker-dealer. Member FINRA SIPC. Today might be the day I drop out of school. Today could be the last day I try. My parents alone can't stop me. My friends can't even stop me. But you might be able to. With United Way, you could tutor me, be my mentor, or volunteer to just read with me. If someone had helped me earlier, I might not be struggling. And studies prove that kids who read well by third grade are more likely to graduate. There are tons of ways people like you can help kids like me stay in school. 
and United Way is calling for you to be one of them. Because it takes 12 years to create a graduate, it takes about the same time to create a dropout. And the difference between me becoming one or the other could be you. Make me a success, not a statistic. Take the pledge to volunteer now at unitedway.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. This is Kansas City's talk station, Talk Radio 710, now on FM at 103.7. Welcome back. You're listening to I Antique with Bruce, and I'm your host, Bruce Limecooler. Our show today is Pocket Watches, the timeless collectible. Coming up next week, we'll be sharing with you tips on how to be a profitable antiques and collectibles dealer in today's market. When we left off, we were talking to Vern Platon about what to look for when buying pocket watches for resale. Now let's get into different types of pocket watches and what you'd need to know. Vern? Yes, sir. How you doing today? We're doing well. I know pocket watches come in all shapes and sizes. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. To start with, in looking for a watch or what, when you're looking at a watch, it's going to be one of two general types. It'll either be an open face or it will be a hunter, which means it has a cover over the front. Uh, an open face watch can be a hinged case front and back. It can be a screw front and back bezel, or it can be a snap that snaps on, snaps off. Most of the dollar watches are that, and we'll talk about what a dollar watch is in a little while on down the road. Then you'll also occasionally see something that's a sidewinder. And your wristwatch, is gen if you have an analog dial, is generally a sidewinder in that the while it's uh, mounted open face, rather than the stem being at 12 o'clock, the stem is at 3 o'clock, and that's what's called a sidewinder on an o in an open face case. Some people may have ordered that watch that way initially. Other people will want a watch because it is a sidewinder, but typically... All a sidewinder is is a hunter movement that has been put into an open face case, either because the original case was melted down, wore out, broke, or something like that. On a hunter case, the watch, the movement has the, the crown and stem at 3 o'clock on an open face at 12. Wow, that's very interesting. You know, you brought up a term, Vern. I like the term hunter watch. Why do they call it that? That's an interesting story, Bruce. Much as the railroad watches have their own uh, mystique, the hunters did in the early days. The original watches were almost like a ball and uh, had a big dome crown on them. And it, uh, initially they had a big dome uh, dial. And it wasn't until centuries after watches were in place uh, on the market that uh, they could even have a crystal. Well, the people... Back in those days, we're talking uh, late 1500s through the 1600s that were hardest on watches, like the railroaders may have been in the last half of the uh, 1800s and the, through the uh, first half of the 1900s, uh, were the hunters. And by that, I mean the, not the guys that go out and bust a few pheasants every Sunday, but the people that hunted in Europe out in the various forests for uh, meat to bring into the town and village markets for resale there. They had to crawl around through the weeds and through the brush. They needed something that, uh, where it would protect that glass uh, crystal over the dial, so they put a cover on it. That is amazing. Well, if you're just now joining us, we're talking about pocket watches, the timeless collectible. You're listening to I Antique with Bruce, and we're brought to you by the Brass Armadillo and iAntique.com. Vern, you're a very interesting guest to have, but I, I have a, another question I'd like to ask you that um, I think that you could tell us a little bit more. Maybe um, you brought up a term when we were talking earlier today about ancient watches. And can you share more about that with us? Of course. Ancient watches are going to be the European watches that were made from the late 1400s on up to through about the 1830s. And the, the, the movement of choice was what was called a verge fusee, and it had a conical cylinder that a chain would wrap around, and that chain uh, would 
let itself out in graduated measures so that it would keep time or some semblance of time uh, until it was completely wound down. Initially, there were no chains. They used catgut, like on a uh, violin string. Oh, my. And the hairsprings on a watch, you see the little coil that bounces around underneath the yes. balance wheel, but initially that was a boar bristle that was straight, and it just kind of wagged back and forth. So you can see they weren't very accurate, they weren't very fine-tuned, and they might keep uh, time within an hour a day if you wound it three or four times a day. Oh, so, my. That's, uh, that's neat. Those watches were around 18 or 1450, let's say, till 1830, and then were phased out for newer and more modern type movements. Well, Vern, you said something interesting, which, you know, brought my ears in, and it said you said something about the transitional watch, and the transitional watch was the one with the gears? Yes. Uh, the, the transitional watch uh, came about uh, actually uh, more recently. Uh, after the Verge Fusees phased out, and they were all key wind and key set. Then our more modern movements, even some of them being the same models that were later made stem wind and stem set, were still key wind and key set. And the era of the uh, key winds ran up till about 1890 in America. By After that, they were dead in the water. But from uh, the mid-1870s, until the mid-1880s, uh, when companies were first coming out with uh, stem wind models, they would make a watch that would be a stem wind lever set or pin set watch, but uh, would still have a pinion or arbor in the back for winding with a key, initially because men would not accept this newfangled notion of a watch that wound by the crown, they just figured, out oh, that's just another part to go wrong and another reason to have to go take my watch to the jeweler, and they wanted the key to fumble with and lose, and probably would do that until trying to wind their watch some morning when it was dark and cold, and they say, oh, I'll use the crown, <laughs> and they use them ever after that. So there was a transitional period. Then I think transitional watches went on a bit longer because the companies had the old parts, and they weren't going to throw them away, so they just threw them into new watches, even though they were obsolete. Oh, my. So was there any other spectrums that, that we didn't get to cover in ancient watches? Oh, for, for purposes of a person looking at watches to buy now, I think not. I think for, for most dealers that are not watch people that just see a watch and they wonder if it's a good deal and if they ought to pick it up, uh, those old watches are fairly temperamental. They're hard to get repaired. They're probably something that unless you just want it as a piece of jewelry or a whatnot, you know, just for for its own sake, don't get it for a watch or fixing it. It's hard to do, so you want to stay away from those. We mentioned just a moment ago talking about transitioning from uh, key wind, key set to lever set, pin set, stem set, and all this type of thing. And... Uh, in a moment here, why we'll discuss what that means so that a, a dealer would know what to look for in that respect. Great. Thanks, Vern. You're listening to I Antique with Bruce, and we're brought to you by the Brass Armadillo. The Brass Armadillo is hosting their bi-monthly free appraisal seminar coming up on Saturday, July 19th, and it starts at 11 a.m. on a first-come, first-served basis. After the break, we will talk more about Pocket Watches, the timeless collectible, Remember that it doesn't make any difference what you collect or what aspect of the antique and collectibles business you are in. You'll learn something here today and every Saturday from 6 to 7 a.m. We'd love to invite you to stop by our store located just off I-70 between exits 21 and 24. I'd really love to see you there. If you are thinking about antiques as a business, the Brass Armadillo is the perfect outlet, and we would love to make you a part of our family. New dealers are like oxygen. They breathe life into the industry. There's still plenty of treasures out there. Could you be the one that finds the next hot item? <laughs> are you starting your day with a KCMO morning show and Greg Knapp? My culture that I grew up in, you never get a C. If you get a C, you should be ashamed of yourself. And there's going to be big problems at the Knapp house if you bring home a C. 
So what happened? Well, I buckled down and worked hard and asked to teach for extra credit, and I got a B. Never got a C. Yeah, culture matters. The KCMO Morning Show with Greg Knapp. Weekdays 5 till 9 on KCMO Talk Radio 710. Now on FM at 103.7. Fox News Radio, I'm Lillian Wu. Hurricane Arthur failed to dampen birthday celebrations across the East Coast last night, including the New York City Macy's Fireworks Spectacular. Arthur is now a tropical storm heading north, bringing tropical storm warnings to Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and other parts of Canada. The president, in his weekly address, thanking those who helped make our country great on Independence Day. I want to say a special thanks to the men and women of our armed forces and the families who served with them especially those service members who spent this most American of holidays serving your country far from home. Republicans also thanking members of the military for their service. Congressman Steve Womack giving the GOP weekly address. Fox News, we report, you decide. Hey, parents of children with asthma, here's another hit from the Breathe Easies. Don't smoke in the house. Don't smoke in the house. Don't smoke around the kids in the house. Don't smoke in the car. Don't smoke in the house. Don't break my heart. Preventing asthma attacks can be as simple as making your home and car smoke-free zones. For more Breathe Easy tips to help stop asthma attacks, go to noattacks.org. Brought to you by the EPA and the Ad Council. In the Senate race between Milton Wolf and Pat Roberts, the difference is crystal clear. Stunning news reports show Milton Wolf exposed private patient x-rays and other personal information on Facebook, where Wolf, quote, relentlessly poked fun at the dead or wounded. A medical ethics expert called Wolf's behavior beyond alarming for a professional in the field of medicine. For Pat Roberts, here's Kansas Marine Derek Brunin. I'm Derek Brunin. I'm a Kansan and a Marine. And so is Senator Pat Roberts. Pat's a lifelong Kansan, one of the most conservative senators in the country. Pat sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution. That's why Pat's fought so hard against Obamacare, taxes, and spending. When Kansans want someone fighting on our side, we want a Marine. We want Senator Pat Roberts. For Kansas, tough, tested, trusted. That's Senator Pat Roberts. I'm Pat Roberts, and I approve this message. Paid for by Roberts for Senate. There's been a rumor going around my school lately about a new draft. So I decided to check out the facts. Turns out, there is no draft. And if there ever was going to be one, we'd have plenty of notice. But you know what else I found out? Young men like me still need to register with Selective Service when we turn 18. Why register when there's no draft? Well, first off, it's the law. Guys have had to register for almost 60 years. Second, if you're a guy living in the U.S. and you don't register... You get shut out of important opportunities like college loans, job training, good jobs, and even a driver's license in most states. But I guess for me, I register because it's the right thing to do. Things are crazy in this world right now. And if the country ever does decide it needs me, I'm going to do my part. Guys, register with Selective Service when you turn 18. Go to sss.gov or your local post office. Attention antique shoppers, if you're looking for the ultimate antique adventure, you will find it at the Brass Armadillo Antique Mall, just off I-70, between exits 21 and 24 in Grain Valley. We are the perfect place to stroll aisle after aisle of fine antiques and collectibles. Whether it's our fine antiques, vintage, or retro items, we have them all. Antiques are what we know at the Brass Armadillo. With hundreds of antique dealers and millions of items, it is a shopper's paradise. So come on out to the Brass Armadillo Antique Mall, just off I-70 between exits 21 and 24 in Grain Valley. We're open 9 to 9 every day. Come see what everybody's talking about. That's the word. We got everybody talking. KCMO, Talk Radio 710, and now on FM at 103.7, the information you count on. Fox News 24-7 on KCMO.
Welcome back. You're listening to I Antique with Bruce, and the title of our show today is Pocket Watches, the Timeless Collectible. Next week, we'll be doing a show on how to be a profitable antique and collectibles dealer. We're brought to you by the Brass Armadillo Antique Mall and our sister networking site of iantique.com, your home for antiques and collectible social networking. If you have any questions or comments before, during, or after the show, please feel free to go to iantique.com and click on the Ask Bruce button. There you'll be able to send us your thoughts, questions, and any photos that you would like to share. Vern, I know that watches are made all over the world. Should a collector or dealer look for a watch based on where it's made? I think so. We're in America. We had an American watch industry that actually did not get off the ground until the 1850s as far as manufacturing goes, and then that was uh, very uh, uh, very rickety and very, uh, uh, very involved. It included bankruptcies, reorganizations of the first two companies that tried. But that stemmed from the fact that as colonies, the European guilds in uh, France, England, Switzerland would not allow colonists to become watchmakers. They wanted to do that in Europe and import the watches here. Yes, you did have a few uh, village uh, home-owned watchmakers that maybe in their lifetime turned out 30 to uh, 60, 100 watches, or uh, a lot of them would buy the parts or a a movement half-finished out of Europe and have it imported over. Then they would finish it off and put their name on. But the first watches were made uh, by a a company that was known as the Boston Watch Company that was made of of the people that eventually separated when they went bankrupt in 1857 and became the Howard Watch Company. And then the American Watch Company was the other faction, or Waltham Watch Company. So I think, you, you know, you're looking at two kinds of watches when you're, looking at a watch you're going to see an american watch or a european and that's generally going to be swiss or english if it's european american watches have more interest because we are in america there's more available there's more parts available and there's more people that uh know how to put those parts into an american watch european watches were always uh made piecemeal they weren't made on uh on a big overall plan like a car plant. They were one watchmaker making one watch rather than one employee making one function of a total watch as they were in America. So I I think to to stay with the American watches, you're doing better. That being said, uh, you find some names on European watches, Patek Philippe, uh, Vacheron Constantine, if you see one of those, it's pretty hard to pass. They're usually <laughs> going to be multiple uh, function, uh, be a chronograph, be a moon-phased calendar watch, uh, a repeater. By that, I mean a watch that uh, will tell you the time in the dark by uh, chiming the time to you in hours and minutes and even seconds. Kind of like a grandfather clock. Kind of like that, only at night you wouldn't want the clock bonging all night, so you'd turn off your clock and if you needed to tell time uh, back before electricity you would just uh, uh, push the lever on your repeater oh that's really cool well if you're just now joining us we are talking about pocket watches the timeless collectible you're listening to i antique with bruce and we're brought to you by the brass armadillo and iantique.com Vern, when someone talks about pocket watches, I think they have a special affinity for the railroad watches. Yes, they can, do. Can you tell us a little about railroad watches? Oh, yes. We could tell you, you know, a railroad watch industry could be a, a topic that would go on for several programs. But in brief, uh, railroad watches developed as, the, uh, you know, the, the railroads came first, the railroad watches came later. And back in the era of the DeWitt Clintons that maybe went 15 or 20 miles an hour so you could jog along the side of them, and if they came off the tracks, people, the passengers could get out and lift them back on. It wasn't until really you had the Transcontinental Railroad and then you had all the spur lines back east with multiple companies 
be using one another's tracks, that time became an important factor. Once time became an important factor, you needed watches that were accurate and reliable. And that's how the railroad watch was uh, developed. The first watch to ever be advertised as a railroad watch in America was made by the American watch company, Waltham, and it was their Crescent Street grade, and it was in it was 1870, and that was still a key wine key set watch, 15 jewels. But the railroad watch is what spawned the jewel wars, basically. Uh, there were uh, people that thought that 15 jewels is all the jewels a watch ever needed. Others went with 17, but as you well know from our discussions, why... Uh, as time went on, they went to 19 jewels for a brief time, just a little before the uh, First World War until just after when everything transitioned to 21 jewels. Then, of course, you had the 23 jewels, which always exceeded railroad requirements, and even the 24, 25, and 26 jewels. It wasn't until about 1893 that the railroad industry got together and des- came came up with a a body of requirements for railroad watches. And initially, they would let you have a hunter. They would let you have a Roman numeral dial. But as time went on, you had to have a watch that was open face, heavy Arabic numbers, uh, easy to read on a white enamel dial with black markers, although there are a couple exceptions. In the uh, early 1930s, there was a silver dial with uh, black numbers that were supposed to be better to read in low light. And also about that time, there was what was called a, a tuxedo dial, which was another metal dial that was silver in the center, had a, a yellowish ivory uh, ring around where the black markers were, and then another uh, silver ring on the outer perimeter. And those were allowed by the railroads also. The other things about a railroad watch as they developed is their adjustments, and they were adjusted for isochronism, which is a fancy word that means the watch would run fully wound at the same speed that it would virtually unwound. They were also adjusted for temperature, and that each watch was actually put in, uh, one, a, a furnace, and two, a refrigerator at varying temperatures to make wow. sure, and they were adjusted to make sure they would run the same hot or cold. Then they were adjusted to position, and by that, we were meaning crown up, crown down, uh, crown to each side, dial up, and dial down. Wow, I'm telling you, you're giving me a real wealth of information, Vern, but remember, here's what we can do for you. If you love antiques and you love to look for antiques, put that together and you have the start of a fun and exciting business. The Brass Armadillo can help with just that. We'll be able to take care of all of your business details, and you only need to stop in and select your booth or showcase to get started. We make it very simple. You can start a business for less than $100 per month. When we return, we will hear some more about Pocket Watches, the timeless collectible. You're listening to iAntique with Bruce, and I'm Bruce Limecooler. We are brought to you by Barras Armadillo Antique Mall and iAntique.com. If you want to send us any questions, please go to Antique, iAntique, and click on the Ask Bruce button and leave us your comments and questions. Coming up next week, we'll be devoting a whole show on how to be a profitable and antique and collectibles dealer. KCMO, Kansas City's home of Mark Levin. Mark Levin. So the bigger problem or the bigger issue is the welfare state. It's the welfare state, whether we're talking about longtime American citizens, Hispanics, Asians, blacks, whites, Everything in between, it's the welfare state that's killing the Republican Party, just as it's killing the nation. The Great One, weekdays 5 to 8 on KCMO Talk Radio 710 and 103.7 FM. Attention antique shoppers, if you're looking for the ultimate antique adventure, you will find it at the Brass Armadillo Antique Mall, just off I-70, between exits 21 and 24 in Grain Valley. We are the perfect place to stroll aisle after aisle of fine antiques and collectibles. Whether it's our fine antiques, vintage, or retro items, we have them all. Antiques are what we know at the Brass Armadillo. With hundreds of antique dealers and millions of items, it is a shopper's paradise. So come on out to the Brass 
Express Armadillo Antique Mall, just off I-70 between exits 21 and 24 in Grain Valley. We're open 9 to 9 every day. Come see what everybody's talking about. That's the word. We got everybody talking. Antiques are all we want. We got everybody talking. Welcome back to The Cat Show. Up next, we have Nico. Nico is a member of the Shelter Pet Group. That's right. A group known especially for their sunspot sleeping, ball chasing, leg rubbing, couch purring, bed leaping, and of course, companionship. Wonderful. And what breed would you say Nico is? I'd have to go with a tabbyish Persian kind of mix. Tremendous cat. I'd also like to point out her coat's wonderful mix of colors. Is it black, gray, gray, black, brown? Somewhere in between. Indeed. You know, it's always special when we get to see a cat like this. Just look how she struts. It's like she owns the place. And how she's so incredibly cute in her indifference to commands. A strong-willed feline. Ah, and see how she curls up and cuddles her person. The pitch on her purring is simply perfect. Nice one. I know. Fantastic cat. Fantastic indeed. But really the best way to know an amazing shelter pet like Nico is to meet one. Visit the shelterpetproject.org today. Adopt. Brought to you by Maddie's Fund, the Humane Society of the United States, and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Joan London, and if you're worried about your parent or a loved one living alone like I was, and you want reliable senior care information, then call A Place for Mom, the nation's largest senior living referral service. With one phone call, you'll get free information on assisted living, Alzheimer's care, nursing homes, even important financial information. It's a free service, so call now. 800-379-1174. 800-379-1174. TrueCar.com is changing car buying forever. Yep, every day, TrueCar users receive negotiation-free, guaranteed savings. Some features not available in all states. TrueCar users save an average of $3,078 off MSRP. When you're ready to buy a car, go to TrueCar.com and find out what others paid for the car you're looking for. Then register at TrueCar to see upfront pricing information and lock in your savings. Finally, just print out your TrueCar savings certificate and take it to the TrueCar certified dealer. Visit TrueCar.com today. That's TrueCar.com. Well, you know that some things in life are just loud. And an MRI scanner is typically in this category. Some things are better left quiet. Minimally Invasive Surgery Hospital is introducing Silent Scan, delivering excellent image quality with an optimized patient experience. Hear the new sound of patient comfort. What does Silent Scan mean for you? No more anxiety and unmatched comfort. If you need an MRI but are claustrophobic or suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, you need to use this revolutionary machine. Not only is this machine silent, but it's non-restrictive. It's also specially designed to accommodate up to 600 pounds of weight. Silent Scan. Just one more way minimally invasive surgery hospital is working to improve patient care in Kansas City. Don't wait any longer and get your stress-free MRI today. 913-322-7401. Greg Knapp. Greg Knapp from the KCMO Morning Show. Happy Independence Day weekend. Don't miss Monday at 7.07 as we bring in U.S. Senator Pat Roberts. God bless America, everybody. Welcome back. We have been listening and talking to Vern Platon about Pocket Watches, the timeless collectible. You're listening to I Antique with Bruce, and I'm Bruce. Don't forget, you can send us your questions, comments, or photos at iantique.com. We would love to get your feedback or questions. You can also follow us on Facebook at Kansas City Barass Armadillo. I would also love to have you come by the store located in Grain Valley, Missouri. We're open 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week, 364 days a year. Remember, it's the best place for the best value. Come see what you can find. Well, let's get back to talking to Vern because I'm really intrigued by the railroad watches. Vern, just what distinguishes a railroad watch from others? Well, that's part of what we've been talking about, Bruce. Certainly the the adjustments are a main thing. Uh, the requirement for jewels, the requirement for uh, a visible dial, uh, the requirement for a case that was sturdy and dust-free to the best of their ability at the time. But you also had uh, uh, many other factors in the movement itself. They were double roller, which means 
it's less likely to go out of action or out of adjustment. You had a compensated balance, which means that, well, as you and I know, on the on the old key wines, you had a a steel circle with uh, with spokes like a motorcycle or something, and it rocked back and yes, forth. Sir. On the railroad watch, they were a laminated wheel uh, of uh, brass or gold on one side and steel on the other side, so that they would because they both would. Uh, take temperatures of heat or cold at different rates. They would stay more true. They also had a split in that ring uh, so that it could expand and contract more readily. And they had all the little holes in there so that a jeweler could uh, place weights on the outside of those wheels to make them swing just right and get an absolutely true rock to that balance uh, wheel. Also, you had a micro-regulator, so rather than just a needle that you could push with your finger from side to side, it was a rather elaborate set, set, uh, set up where uh, a jeweler would have to adjust it with a screwdriver just to get everything set just right. And the, the regulator was used to make just fine adjustments in a watch to uh, either put more tension on the hairspring or less to make it uh, keep time better. Well, that's really, really interesting. If you're just now joining us, we're talking about pocket watches, the timeless collectible. You're listening to I Antique with Bruce, and we're brought to you by the Brass Armadillo Antique Mall and iAntique.com. Vern, I really enjoyed the discussion on railroad watches, but I'd like to get into a little bit of a different area. The true evolution of watches came about just prior to the Civil War. I guess you'd say that's when it really took hold. Could you tell us a little about what happened? Yes. The first company to form, as mentioned, was the Boston Watch Company. It went uh, broke in a depression in 1857, which was much like we've experienced just four years ago, where uh, banks too big to fail were failing, and that was the exact terminology used in 1857. Well, the Boston Watch Company failed. Uh, Ed Howard went his way. He already had a successful watch company, or excuse me, clock company in Boston. He just devoted part of that factory to building watches. The people that, uh, uh, that did not go with him stayed with Waltham and made a watch company there, which was called American Watch Company and later just Waltham Watch Company. And after that, a number of other companies developed. Uh, during the Civil War, the only two manufacturers of watches in America was Howard and American or Waltham. And the difference in the two companies was Ed Howard wanted to make watches on the English Guild system where each employee was responsible for a whole watch. Waltham used a a manufacturing uh, technique where each employee was responsible for one function. In other words, an assembly line. Oh, wow. So kind of like making a car. Just exactly (laughs) the same. And uh, by the end of the Civil War, they'd made 180000 plus, while Howard had made something around uh, twenty twenty five thousand. 25000 Don't even know because he didn't keep records that well. Other companies that are of importance that a, a person looking at a watch to buy ought to know in addition to those two are Elgin, which was the third company to start in 1867 in uh, Elgin, Illinois. The Illinois Watch Company that started in 1871-72 in Springfield, Illinois, and the last and probably most successful watch company for uh, uh, duration was Hamilton that started in the 1890s, but it was the last American company to go out of business. Their last pocket watch was a railroad watch called a 4992B in 1969, and then they also ceased to be an American company. Wow. Other good brands that are secondary brands as far as collectability after these would be the Columbus Watch Company that grew and started in 1874 in Columbus. And, of course, his own company then, which in, that we know, you know, in, in Cincinnati, the Grew and Watch Company, yes, sir. Uh, was mostly a Swiss company where he would import parts in and then build watches with his name on them. But from time to time, like in the Second World War, when... Uh, Switzerland was having trouble making watches there. Gruen actually was making parts for Rolex watches here and shipping them uh, to to Switzerland to be 
assembled as Rolex watches. Wow. Other companies would be the Rockford Watch Company of Rockford, Illinois. Seth Thomas, that was a good clock company, didn't come about making watches until the 1880s. South Bend Watch Company, which the Studebaker brothers owned. Remember, they were uh, wagon makers that then became car makers, but they also bought a watch company, and they bought the Columbus Watch Company that had reorganized in 1893 in that depression when uh, uh, Gruen and his Columbus Company went broke. Then you also had the Hampton Watch Company in Canton, Ohio. Originally, it was in Springfield, uh, Massachusetts. But uh, a watch case maker named John Duber ran afoul of the uh, of the watch uh, giants, Elgin, Illinois, Waltham, those companies, and they wouldn't buy his cases. So he bought a, a watch company so that he'd have something to put his cases on until the troubles passed. So uh, from... From the 1880s on, why John Duber owned the Hampton Watch Company until it sold out uh, entirely in the late 1920s to Russia, who moved the, all the equipment, all the parts, all the stock over to Russia and just made Russian watches from there on. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, we're getting closer to the end, but I have a question just for you. What's your favorite watch that you've ever collected? You know... It depends on the day I'm looking at it. Uh, I, I don't know that I have one favorite, but certain, certainly I like the uh, older Walthams. I think key wines are a sleeper. They were only made from the 1850s to the 1890s in America. Uh, there's a lot of them around, and they're a good, durable watch, and were very fine for the time. Of course, the railroad watches are, too. They were the best in the world at their time. You know, that brings up a quick little point. You were telling me that the railroad watches were critical. Why would why was it so critical that they be so timely? Well, because uh, songs like the Wreck of the Old 97 uh, <laughs> and Casey Jones were actually wrecks that did occur that did prompt uh, watch companies to, uh, or the railroads to demand more precise watches so that uh, you wouldn't have an engine coming and going on the same track from different directions and cause the wrecks. And it was a, a time matter. Well, Vern, I sure do appreciate you coming in today. Thank you so much for all the insight and knowledge that you have given to me. Well, my pleasure, Bruce. It's always a joy to be together with you. Thank you. Well, next week's show is going to be on how to be a profitable antique and collectibles dealer. You're listening to I Antique with Bruce. And we are sponsored by the Brass Armadillo and iAntique.com. Remember that it doesn't make any difference what you collect or what aspect of the antique business you're in. You will learn something here today and every Saturday from 6 to 7 a.m. We'd love to invite you to stop by our store located just off of I-70 between exits 21 and 24. I would love to see you there. And if you're thinking about antiques as a business, the Brass Armadillo is the perfect outlet. I, for one, would love to make you a part of our family. New dealers are like oxygen. They breathe life into the industry. There are still plenty of treasures out there. Could you be the one that finds the next hot item? The Brass Armadillo is the best place for the best value. Come see what you can find. Attention antique shoppers, if you're looking for the ultimate antique adventure, you will find it at the Brass Armadillo Antique Mall, just off I-70, between exits 21 and 24 in Grain Valley. We are the perfect place to stroll aisle after aisle of fine antiques and collectibles. Whether it's our fine antiques, vintage, or retro items, we have them all. Antiques are what we know at the Brass Armadillo. With hundreds of antique dealers and millions of items, it is a shopper's paradise. So come on out to the Brass Armadillo. Armadillo Antique Mall, just off I-70 between exits 21 and 24 in Grain Valley. We're open 9 to 9 every day. Come see what everybody's talking about. That's the word. We got everybody talking. Antiques are all we We got everybody talking. Everybody's talking about the brass.